Andy, I've been thinking about the metrics we use for the podcast and I've noticed a bit of an issue. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure what you're looking at. I mean, our listener numbers look great. More people are listening all the time and we're definitely trending in the right direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, that's fine. That's great. But it's our guests. I mean, most of them come on just once and then they churn out. I mean, we don't retain anyone. We've had a couple of people on twice, but I just hate seeing them disappear. Okay, I see. No, no, actually, I don't see. I mean, Lily, that's what's supposed to happen. If we kept the guests on for every subsequent episode, that would make for a terribly crowded studio and a pretty awful user experience. Okay, yeah, I know. I know that, Randy, really. I was just <laughs> trying to come up with, like, you know, a good segue into our episode topic. And instead of being, you know, like, Burton Journey from... Burton Journey. <laughs> Sesame Street. <laughs> hey, <Bill>. um, <laughs> For this week's intro, because this episode is all about churn or journey. <laughs> okay, that that makes sense. But that's officially the worst joke I've ever heard. So, of course, I love it. Um, <laughs> let's get right to our chat with Andrew Michael. He's the host of his own podcast, Churn FM, which probably doesn't have quite as bad jokes, and the founder and CEO of Avrio. The Product Experience is brought to you by Mind the Product. Every week on the podcast, we talk to the best product people from around the globe. Visit mindtheproduct.com to catch up on past episodes and discover more. Browse for free or become a Mind the Product member to unlock premium content, discounts to our conferences around the world, and training opportunities. Mind the Product also offers free product tank meetups in more than 200 cities. And there's probably one near you. Hi, Andrew. Really great to be talking to you today on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much, Lee. It's great to be here. So before we get started on our topic today of churn, um, and please don't leave us before we get started. <laughs> <laughs> Um, would you love to give us a quick intro into who you are and uh, what you do and how you got there? Very nice. Yes, thanks. So uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Avrio, and we basically help teams analyze and share customer research more effectively. And I'm also the show host of Churn FM, which is the podcast for subscription economy pros, focusing on using ways to use retention to fuel growth. So uh, we talked a little bit about this off air, but the podcast itself actually started over three years ago. And the idea back then really was I was a previous founder. I was working at Hotjar at the time. I wanted to start something new, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. So I thought, let me build an audience first. And then when I was ready, I could sell to that audience was the general idea. And um, so I started the podcast with that in mind. And uh, we're three years in now and learned a ton from it. It's been an amazing experience. And uh, it's actually given an back in so many different ways that I didn't expect it to either. So, Amazing. And um, so we're going to be talking about churn today. In the podcast, you've done it for like three years. So I'm guessing like going so deep into one subject, you must have some incredible insights into, you know, how to kind of manage churn for your business. So I'm going to go straight in at the deep end and ask you, what are your top three takeaways from all of your interviews about churn? Yeah, this is a super tough question because actually I recently as well spoke at How to Web and I was trying to like condense everything to find out what was like the biggest takeaways that I could share with the audience. And I think for me, like there's definitely recurring themes that happen in the episodes. I think the number one like issue I see with companies and that get this wrong is really when there's not strong alignment within the organization. And when there's sort of like a shift of uh, responsibility onto individual teams, so it's like, oh, this is customer success is problem, or, or we can only do this by solving it with product, um, or something's happening with marketing or sales, and uh, then it's like, okay, customer success, you go and fix this now. But there's just so many inputs that influence the final output metric. And really, like, if you tell me any role within a company, I can show you how they can influence churn and retention. And when companies that do this really well, they understand this and they really have this strong alignment throughout the company and they realize, okay, if we're building a subscription business, people are canceling subscriptions, we're not really building a business, we're just wasting our time. So 
this needs to be a company metric. It needs to be full alignment, like from top down to bottom up. Uh, and the best companies get this right. Uh, so I think that's probably been one of the biggest uh, learnings, I would say. And actually, funny enough as well, at Hotjar, we saw the similarly where in the beginning, we were all just pulling different strings in different directions. But then when we actually took a step back, we came up with strategy. Uh, everybody understood how they influenced the metric in the output is really, really saw like sort of the step change uh, in churn uh, and increase in retention. And uh, Andrew, just before you go into step two, the, the, yeah. like the next key takeaway, um, ha- like how how did businesses achieve that alignment um, across the different teams? Because I can totally imagine the conversations of marketing being like, we're funneling loads of people to you and you're just losing them all. Like, that's not our fault. Um, yeah. and, and how that kind of happens. So, like, how do those teams actually get to that conclusion and work together really, really well in order to own churn across the whole business? Yeah. So it, it actually starts as well, like with one of the other areas where people get this really right is like, obviously, and we are talking in product and if I tell you, like, put the customer at the center, it's like, how many times have we heard this? But really, it starts off like having this deep, deep understanding of who the customer is, like what are the use cases and uh, how do we deliver value? Because ultimately, if you're not delivering value at the end of the day, people are going to churn. They come to you for that. It's really, really that simple. Like that's probably, it's probably the simplest and most complicated problem to solve in a company at any time. So they they understand that this is the core center. And then from there, they're able to understand how their individual roles influence that metric. So um, typically what you'll see is they might have some sort of a KPI tree where the final output metric is a retention and uh, they might really want to focus more on an input metric. So it would be, okay, we understand that the highest retention comes from users that show this behavior in activation. Uh, and it will be like uh, weekly active value achievers. Let's call this metric itself there. And then they're able to work that way backwards throughout the organization and understand, okay, our ideal customer profile are the best fit for the type of people that are getting to that value point and they're consistently achieving it. So sales, like it's no longer about just closing deals. You need to now also close deals and you need to make sure that those deals are renewing and uh, they're part of our ICP. So this is like one of the big breakdowns. Typically where you see sales selling to the wrong fit. Uh, yeah. How do you deal with that? With So sales teams typically are really good at going out and getting deal. But then there's it often gets handed over to somebody else who then becomes the account manager or customer success. So how do you make sure that there's alignment uh, between both of those departments or both of those teams straight away? Sure. Yeah. So what the best companies think they do is they align the compensation uh, towards like making sure you're bringing in the right customers. So when they're earning commission, they're not just getting like they'll get maybe 50 percent on the first sale and then they'll get 50 percent when that customer renews. And likewise, like the commissions then would happen with their handoff with customer success as well. So the incentives shift in organizations that really have a strong focus on retention and they realize, okay, it's not just about closing anything and everything. It really is like we should be closing the right fit because closing the wrong fit customers end up putting a much bigger strain on the organization than we realize. Like from a product perspective, you're collecting feedback from the wrong type of users. So you end up building the wrong things from a support perspective. They typically need a lot more support and more help. So all of these issues sort of unfold itself and the companies that realize this, they really have this focus in the beginning. And that's why like having the core center of who the customer is, then you can work backwards and say, okay, how does each team's role play towards this customer and fulfilling value for them? And then like, if you look at marketing, for example, you might realize, okay, uh, our best fit customers come from the specific channel. This is the use case that they're going for. So Content's team's role is to acquire a certain amount of ideal customer profiles from the content that you generate. And like you make acquisition targets also at a quality level on top of it as well. So it's not just the number of total leads coming through the door, but really these need to be good qualified leads uh, that are coming through and then sales picking that up at the end of it. That makes sense for B2B, but when you're consumer focused, you're not necessarily going through a sales force. So how do you make sure that you're acquiring the right customers uh, and or how do you handle churn for a consumer-focused business? Yeah, I, I think in consumer, it is a little bit more complex uh, itself there and the research and the understanding of like what ideal customer profile means for you there can be a lot more broad or it can be a lot more narrow depending uh, on the context. And I think there are different services out there that you can use. So like Clearbit is one of them for enrichment. 
uh, and really just trying to understand, okay, what are sort of the firmographic and demographic properties that uh, your consumers share amongst like the, the ideal fit and then be able to score and uh, understand like what is the quality coming through. So even if you're serving in a B2C environment, you can use enrichment services that allow you to qualify specific leads or the other way is like have things in your signup form and asking specific uh, questions. So like the main thing is like, what is the main use case? Like why are you using our product? Uh, a simple question like that can be used later in delivering value to your customers, but also help segment. Are these the right fit? Are they coming to us for the use case that we believe our product should be used for? Um, and like I see this in, in my current startup now as well, Davrio, we, we built a product for uh, product teams to conduct and facilitate research, but we do see a lot of students using uh, the product now and which would say is like more of a B2C uh, use case in that environment. Um, but having that field that sign up gives us that context and it allows us then to segment and say, okay, yes, this is a good fit. This is where we want to spend our time. This is the feedback we want to be uh, paying attention to or not. Amazing. And um, I completely cut you off earlier when you were going through your top three <laughs> takeaways, just because the first one was so good. Um, what, so what are your other kind of two key takeaways? Yeah, so the, the second one was really around, uh, as I mentioned, understanding who that ideal uh, customer profile is and deeply understanding like what is the value that you're delivering to them. And actually, one of the stories, like I, I mentioned, there's a few different stories I mentioned on the podcast a lot, just from episodes uh, that we've uh, we've had. And uh, one of them was actually from Heidi Gibson, who was at GoDaddy at the time. And GoDaddy, at some point, they were trying to launch their new website builder, and they ended up struggling with the actual conversion and retention at the end of it. And they were just tracking like arbitrary metrics to begin with, like uh, website setup. Uh, was like the main metric they were optimizing towards. And then they slowly like started to dive deep into their customers' needs and why they were coming to them. And uh, it seems pretty obvious, but what they realized was that the shop owner didn't come to them to set up a website. They came to them to get more sales. The hairdressing salon wanted bookings. The uh, online food delivery wanted orders. And they were able then to take a step back and say, hey, we have this data readily available because we offer e-commerce solutions and we offer delivery. So they shifted their focus into setup to focus, okay, what is the end result in value that we're delivering our customers and work back for there from there. So what do the best uh, sellers do? What are the setup? What is their setup moment look like? What are the things they're onboarding their customers, they're onboarding themselves with? And then use that to re-engineer behavior. And they really, really saw a step change in making that shift in tracking value, but it comes down to like knowing who their customers really were and what they valued uh, at the end of the day. So yeah, that was number two. And then th I think there's like varied degrees of like the impact that people will have. And one question I ask a lot, and it's really a trick question on the show is like, if you had 90 days to turn turn around, what would you do? Uh, and don't tell me you're going to go speak to customers and look at data because that's just a cop out. It's like, just pick a tactic that you'll see. And most people say like you can't turn things around in 90 days. And yes, they're right because it takes a lot longer to, to fill. Uh, and other things then will turn to like things like churn deflection or delinquent churn management and dunning services. But really like what I've learned through the podcast is the absolute like biggest impact you can have on churn and retention really is at onboarding and activation. Uh, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. I think most people, when they first approach the problem of churn and retention, they start to think like, how do we stop people from leaving us? As opposed to how do we make sure more people get value from our product or service and what do we need to do? So I'd say that's like a big shift in mindset. You see the best companies realize like I need to be focusing on how do I activate my users? How do I make sure I onboard them effectively so they get to that, that value? as opposed to really focusing on like, why are people churning and uh, at the end of the day. So the best companies like have a really strong focus on onboarding and they also realize that that impact is compounding. So like a small increase in adoption uh, at uh, sign up really compounds over time and over the life cycle rather than just trying to win back a few customers that are uh, already lost for the most part anyway and tend to be typically very difficult to win back. Churn is, you know, the absolute ultimate in lagging metrics, you know, you can't find out until after well, by definition. So, and you're just talking about onboarding as potentially a good leading metric. I'm curious 
what else can you use? I'm just obviously, you know, setting something up and running an experiment on journey is going to be a very long experiment. So in your experience, what are good leading metrics? What are good predictors of churn reduction? Yeah. So I, there's a few different things I'd say. The first one is like the lead scoring itself. So uh, this is quite like a, a good rudimentary exercise that you can take on your own as well. We actually did at some point at Hotjar. And it was really just taking a look at um, who are our best fit customers. So we took a cohort who had been with us for longer than 12 months that paid X amount and were certain levels of act, like activity within the product. And we actually ran it through a service like Clearbit. So we enriched the sites and we enriched the users themselves. From there, you get a certain level of firmographic and demographic properties. And you can then create like a scoring model. Uh, so what you can tend to see is, okay, uh, let's say this is uh, now redundant anyway, but Alexa rank is going away. Alexa rank, like the higher, the, the lower the Alexa rank was like a really good indicator of a good fit customer and a likelihood of retention. Uh, and then you find like these few different firmographic or demographic properties that tend to be good fits. So at the earlier stage, you can really start qualifying leads better and say, okay, you're not saying like this is our ideal customer profile is companies of 50 to 100 who have uh, 200 employees and do 50 million in revenue. Like you don't need to tick all the boxes, but you just get a score, uh, a range. And if they tick one of the properties, like they get a three point or two point or one point. And what we found then was like you could really understand like the quality was the first indicator if the customers were going to retain or not. So that was one way to sort of determine how things were, were working out for you. And then, yes, like the next thing is really like looking what are the inputs that users end up doing that end up retaining longer and what are those that don't. Uh, and typically those tend to be things that people are doing at onboarding and everybody talks about the wow, wow moment or the aha um, and that's definitely like in the B2C environment, if people don't experience that aha moments like relatively quickly, uh, they tend to be like high risk for churn and uh, almost very, very difficult. And a couple of things like I've learned and changed my thinking on the podcast was one of the things was from uh, Sean Klaus at the time when he was at Atlassian. And we always like have this idea that we need to rush people through onboarding and get them to that value as fast as possible. Uh, but sometimes as well, it's also really important to slow things down and remember that the most attention you're ever going to get from your customer is that first initial experience when they sign up for your product. Like, And if you're not able to get them to a point where you're achieving value and you're actually able to deliver that, like you've pretty much lost them at that point. And what Atlassian actually found like uh, counterintuitive to what most people think is that their biggest indicator of if a customer would retain long-term or not was the time they spent in their first session. And the greater the time that they spent in their first session, the more likely they were to retain. So there are certain indicators like this that you can start to take a look at at the early activation period of, in terms of what are the actions they're taking and uh, how they can go about it. And you mentioned earlier um, weekly active value achievers. What does that mean? I've not heard that term before. Yeah. So I think this is just like um, going back to the GoDaddy example that we gave before is really GoDaddy realized that the value that people came to them for wasn't the website. The value that they were getting was actually the end result, which is the sales or the online bookings. And what they would do then is like they would group the end value that they received and see like how many people on a weekly basis actually drove sales or got bookings. And for most businesses, you can get to a point where you can measure the value or get relatively close to the value and um, yeah so essentially that's just like another way of phrasing maybe whatever the metric is at your business that delivers value to to customers a moment ago you were talking about cohorts and this is i think something that people don't always understand it's not just about churn as an overall thing so can you tell us a little bit about how you put cohorts together to to measure this yeah so uh, cohorts is like obviously the best, the only way really to measure churn and retention uh, itself. And it's understanding uh, what your different cohorts look like. And by cohorts, you can either split them by day, by week, by month, quarter, year, like that's really up to you. And essentially what you're trying to look at is, let's take an example that we want to look at a cohort of users that signed up in week uh, one of 2022. And you track that cohort of users, those groups. So let's say there was 500 signups in, in week one of uh, 2022. And you can monitor their behavior over time then to see slowly, okay, 
uh, by week two, how many are still retained by week three, how many are still retained by week four. And then slowly what you can do is map that out uh, and understand like either you're doing really well and you have like a little bit of a dip maybe the first three, four weeks and then you start to see a flattening out. And uh, in some cases, if, depending if we're talking about user retention or net MRR retention, ideally like what you really want to see, and I think a lot of people have heard this before, but is that smiley face where you end up seeing a little bit of a dip uh, in due to churn, but then slowly over time through expansion revenue and through reactivation, uh, you're able to achieve sort of a smile uh, in your metrics. And this is more towards the B2B case, but can be applicable as well in, in B2C. So yeah, cohorts like are really, really effective in monitoring and tracking changes over time. And also important to see sort of like keep an eye on them to see how changes in your product affect uh, churn and retention over time as well. Because as you mentioned, like it's a really lagging metric and a lot of times like only a few months later you realize, oh shit, like, yeah, I don't know, like what did we do back then? Uh, there was some big change and we've really impacted a cohort of users going forward. And most of the time, like when you make big shifts like that, you can see like stark changes either positive or negative in your cohorts. But like as an aggregate, it's very difficult just to understand the movements and see the changes. Mm. And what about churn prediction? Can that actually be done accurately? You kind of mentioned before, I think it was Atlassian that um, discovered that the very first session sort of predicted how customers would churn later. Yeah. So uh, I think most companies all follow like a similar format uh, for this and understand. And uh, actually Ziv Pellard, who is the chief customer officer at AppsFlyer, like we've had him on the show like a couple of times. And what they as well tend to realize, it all goes back to the same sort of focus on like what are the activation metrics that people need to do. So you take a look at the your most successful cohort of users. What are the key actions that they've been doing? Uh, you'll tend to as well look at, like going back to, are they qualified? Uh, you'll then also look at their usage over time and how that changes. And most like, companies will typically build a model then off the back of this and they'll say, okay, if our customers like don't meet these certain criteria, they're origin- like from the start, they're a risk. Uh, we need to flag them and understand like how we deal with this risk. If they don't take certain actions in the product, uh, this is another risk and they end up just sort of like the churn prediction itself is really more like risk flagging and this typically tends to be customer success teams uh, that would focus on this then afterwards like in a B2B environment where they can see okay uh, we know that cus- our best fit customers have achieved X, Y or Z by this period in their usage those that don't uh, end up being flagged within their, their churn prediction if you want to call that it's maybe a, a very simple way uh, of doing it but ultimately that's really what it comes down to it's like the models can get more and more complex but it's really just looking for individual signals that you know the best fit customers take and then seeing those that don't take those actions and treating those as uh, causes for concern and one of the interesting things actually apps fly ended up doing was they realized that okay this these certain key actions that are really tied and correlated to retention and expansion and they tied their customer success compensation to activation for those specific features. And uh, so the customer success team then sort of realized, okay, within month one, these are the things we need to get our customers to do. In month like three, in month 12, uh, and they had a game plan then in terms of like how they would activate users and get them to expand into different products and services that they had within the organization. Uh, and the results, I can't remember them exactly, but... I'm going to just throw a random number now, but I think it was something <laughs> like in the region of like 50 or 100 million, like they ended up generating from this exercise. Like it was a crazy number uh, at the time, I remember. So, Wow, that's amazing. So we've been talking all this time about churn as if it's a bad thing, and generally it is. But is there ever a time when it's not? Is there an anti-pattern or is there a time when churn is good? Yeah. So this is something like I wrestled with a lot as well, personally, like previously, I think when you're working in an SMB environment or like in a B2C environment, you'll tend to typically have like much higher uh, churn uh, than most businesses or specifically like in an enterprise. And to a certain degree, like there is this idea of acceptable churn uh, versus uh, non-acceptable churn. So the first thing is like I think at an early stage when you're getting started, you're typically going to end up having uh, a higher uh, churn and retention because like 
your product is not as sophisticated. It has like a lot of issues with it still potentially. So they are sort of just like that early stage uh, where churn itself is just fueling revenue that you're into. Now, I like the analogy as well of building like a log fire, like building a fire. In the beginning, you start out with little twigs and they might not be the best fit customers and they're not going to stick around for the longest. They're going to come in and they're going to burn fast, but they're going to give you the fuel that you need to find the logs, to find the ideal customer profile, to get those, to start burning those. And then you start to build a more and more healthy fire that's going to be sustainable and burns uh, longer over time. So I think it depends on like the environment that you're in and the customers that you serve. There is a certain acceptable uh, level of churn. One of the best things like I think I heard on this was Emmerich Ernol, who was from Agora Pulse, the CEO, they serve SMBs, so they had a service that does social media management. And uh, there's quite a lot of services out there. And typically when you're working with small businesses, the churn rate becomes pretty high. And what they did was an exercise at some point was at their churn exit survey, they took a look at what are the reasons for churn. And they then segmented it and said, okay, like what are the reasons we can control and what are the reasons we can't? So a small business that goes out of business is like really not something that's within the control that they, have, they can actually do anything about. So they said, okay, this 10% of churn, like or 15 or 20% of churn, like we don't care about it. Like there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Like it's just a, a nature of doing business in SMB. Uh, and then they sort of segmented by these different types and then said, okay, like there's 60% of our churn we can actually influence. And uh, then they set targets against that and realized. So I'd say there's two aspects. One is like realizing what you can control versus what you can't control. And the stuff you can't control, that's always going to happen. So it's just the nature of doing business, perhaps in your certain segment or space. And then the second thing is well, just, I think, understanding the timing uh, of where you're at and who you're serving. And in the early days, like you can't, it's very difficult to turn away customers and say, okay, this is not a good fit when you're running out of runway, you really need to close that next deal. So I think you just need to be a little bit realistic and understanding, but also coming to it with a mindset that you understand and you know that this is not a long-term play and it's not sustainable and ultimately it's going to end up costing us more than ads, but uh, it's just the nature of timing and what's right for the business at this time. Angie, this has been so good. Um, I, there's so much that I want to dig into, but we're running out of time, sadly. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. My question is, what do people get wrong about churn? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of the case studies that you've had on the podcast where people have um, done it really well and they've kind of managed it really well. Um, and, and we did have a few examples of how people get it wrong around sort of not strong alignment across the business. But are there any other sort of major gotchas or things that people should watch out for when they're uh, trying to manage retention? Yeah. So the first thing is actually something we got wrong, I think, in the early days. It goes back to the alignment a little bit, but what we ended up doing at Hotshot at some point was we tried to put together a churn team uh, and we thought, okay, we were going to get like a few different individuals from the organization and from different teams and they were going to come and like solve churn. Uh, and in retrospect, it's an absolutely terrible idea because uh, ultimately it's a team uh, game and a team sport and to drive change, like everybody needs to be working on it. So I think uh, that's definitely like from personal experience mistake that we made in the early days uh, trying to figure things out. Uh, the next mistake as well, I think, is that most companies end up starting to focus on churn. Uh, and that's really not what you need to be focusing on when you're solving for churn and retention. It's really like focus on the value that you deliver your customers and like you end up solving uh, the problem at the end of it. But we obsess like so much in the beginning, like we see this number and like, oh, we're losing so much revenue every month. We need to do, we need to fix churn, we need to fix churn, we need to fix churn. And you hear this a lot within different companies. But then nobody really understands what that means. Uh, and then you just end up creating more chaos and anxiety within the organization without them really having a clear understanding of uh, why this matters and how we can go about it. So the, what pe most people will get wrong in the beginning when they first focus on this, they'll do things like a churn exit survey and they'll say, okay, like what are the reasons for churn? And then let's go try and solve these things. And uh, But what they end up realizing is like the biggest value is really onboarding. And actually something I like as well that adapted from like the conversion rate optimization world and a lesson like I got from David and uh, from Ciaro is that when we ask for feedback like why did you churn um, typically like we're getting feedback as well from a certain audience who are probably never meant to be a customers anyway as well and we mix that in with customers that we probably could have kept 
Whereas probably a more uh, powerful way of collecting feedback is actually at the time of renewal and just asking one question to customers that have renewed and saying, what almost stopped you from renewing today? And in that light, like you're going to get really strong feedback from customers who actually just paid you. So that's in their best interest to give you feedback because typically like it's very difficult to get feedback from somebody that's just churned. So uh, ultimately, like uh, the, the stuff that you collect, like it either needs to be done by third party. It's very expensive, time consuming and uh, difficult to get anything of value. So actually asking customers that have just renewed and saying like, what was it that nearly stopped you from renewing today? Uh, you get one like, because you know those are good fit customers because even despite the issues they have with your product, they still decided to renew. Um, so I think that's also another area where like we spend a lot of time focusing on these people that have just left, but like there's a whole group of people always that are renewing with your product and continuing to use it. And there's definitely things that are bugging them about the product that you could be resolving that could potentially save those others that have ended up uh, churning in the end. So I'm going to ask a question that might go totally against that, but if there is someone who you believe is in your ideal customer profile and they do churn, you know, if it's somebody that, that hurts, what's the best way to then go back and talk to them? I mean, you've lost them. You've potentially lost the relationship. Yeah. What's a good way of actually going and getting a proper insight from them? Yeah. So it's, like I said, it's tend to be typically difficult because at that stage they are either really upset with the product or they just don't have the time of day to give you anymore because let's face it, like who has time to give other products feedback? I think as product people, we tend to give more feedback because we understand and appreciate uh, the challenges. But in certain businesses, uh, it can be quite challenging. And I think in most cases, like what companies tend to resort to is just incentivizing. And you might say, okay, like, is it good to incentivize feedback? I think... Uh, typically it's not the best thing but ultimately it's what you really need to do and then through that it's really just being about deliberate and telling them listen like be as blunt and direct as possible like literally whatever you say you're not going to hurt our feelings in any way if anything you're going to do us a just justice by being nice uh, and the incentives i think is like the only way i've really seen people effectively be able to reach out and uh, gain good insight from them and just to be really clear, incentives, you mean like a 50 pound 15. gift card kind of thing? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. That's fantastic. Andrew, thank you very much for this. Uh, we don't want to churn you out as a guest, but we have run out of time. So. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. This has been amazing. Thanks very much, brother. It was great joining. And uh, thanks so much again for the invite. The product experience is the first and the best podcast from Mind the Product. Our hosts are me, Lily Smith, and me, Randy Silver. Lou Ron Pratt is our producer, and Luke Smith is our editor. Our theme music is from Hamburg based band POW, that's P A U. Thanks to Arnie Kittler, who curates both Product Tank and MTP Engage in Hamburg, and who also plays bass in the band for letting us use their music. You can connect with your local product community via Product Tank, regular free meetups in over 200 cities worldwide. If there's not one near you, maybe you should think about starting one. To find out more, go to mindtheproduct.com forward slash product tank. <laughs>